All right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay. Well, welcome to our spring series of guest lecture. Um, this time we have uh, two very exciting speakers, and I'll come to them in a minute. So just wanted to do a quick reminder. Um, on March 5th, we have the D3E, okay? It's a student career preparation session, okay? So we'll meet here at 2 o'clock from 2 to 3.30. We have uh, tips given by career specialists on interviewing skills, on salary negotiations. Even if it's not directly connected to you right now at a younger studio level, it'll help you when you're you know, get, gathering your internships and things like that. So remember, on March 5th, we have D3 from 2 to 3.30. And then for students who are interested, there's going to be an elevator speech, elevator speech session where the career specialist will critique your elevator speeches. OK? That's a three-minute kind of spiel about yourself. Um, and on that evening, our IIDA student body has organized a portfolio review. OK, we'll have IIDA uh, members from the professional community come and do portfolio reviews. So that's going to be after, uh, I think, around 6.15, after the elevator pitches are done. So remember, D3 on March 5th, make a mental note of it and uh, uh, participate as much as you can. And then for our graduating seniors, we have the career fair happening on March 8th. OK, that's going to be in the uh, Graham Center ballrooms. I think we have about 40 different firms coming in. And even if you're a junior student, you can participate uh, from 3 to 4 o'clock. It's an open uh, desk session, OK? So you can see the different firms, what they do. You can interact with them. If you have a portfolio, you can show them your portfolio and get to know them. So that's on March 8th. Okay? So March 5th is student career preparation, and March 8th, which is Friday, um, is a career fair. And then on March 12th, we have the second guest speaker coming, Adam Tihani. He's a very big hospitality designer in New York, and uh, he'll be here on March 8th. Oh, sorry, March 12th. And then our advisory board will be meeting on March 15th. And uh, these will be leaders from the industry. We talk to them about our curriculum issues, about future trends in interior design. And it helps us as faculty to structure our curriculum as well as things we are doing well and not doing so well. Okay? So those are the reminders. But today, of course, we have two very exciting speakers. We have Julia Melhauser, and uh, she is the founder of Curated Company in Florida, and then Sandy Oakley. Uh, so please give them a warm welcome. <laughs> and today they'll be speaking about this topic of future of work. I'll just quickly give a very brief bio. Julia is the founder of Curated Company, an independent group that represents some of the leading design-driven brands in Florida and Caribbean. Um, prior to, her, to this role, she brought her expertise as a workplace consultant uh, for Steelcase, an innovative leader in workplace research and design. Her career also includes a tenure as a senior interior designer at PGAL, and as she has received numerous honors and she has also been an active member of our FI advisory board. Incidentally, I knew Julia in Missouri, where she was also a member of advisory board. And for some reason, we connected here and said, did I see you in Missouri? Yes. <laughs> All right. And then Sandy Oakley serves as the vice president of sales at Watson Furniture Group in Washington state. Um, I think currently she's coming from North Carolina. Uh, with a passion of, for furniture, that she proudly identifies as a self-proclaimed furniture geek. Okay? Um, she has 27 years of experience working in some of the furniture industry's biggest names. Her journey began as a corporate events coordinator for a manufacturer based in High Point, North Carolina. If you know High Point, it's a place where 
it's very famous for furniture and making, right? So she comes up with almost all these abundant experiences. So without further ado, Julia and Sandy. Thank you. So today, um, we're really, really excited to be here because both Sandy and I have um, unique experience in the workplace environment. And um, I've worked on both sides. I've been a licensed interior designer and then went into the furniture side. And then now, um, I don't know what that is. And <laughs> don't, yeah, turn yours Getting off. Get away from you. Turn yours off. Get away from me. Um, and now have my own um, group, Curated Co. So we're going to walk through. Um, it's important to know the history of where the workplace came from. So we're going to walk through the history of the workplace, then the current state, and then kind of talk about the things that we need to be designing for and talking to our clients about. So as Newton mentioned, um, he and I met at the University of Missouri, my alma mater, and then I get instantly, um, when I moved to Florida, became really involved at FIU because I have a passion for the design industry and I wanted to be involved with students just like I was back home. So I worked for numerous um, national firms and um, worked in corporate design. So the minute I got out of college, um, majored in interior design, the minute I got out, I uh, got NCIDQ certified and started working in workplace and designed global headquarters for Edward Jones Investments and worked on large, um, large projects from there. I decided once I moved down that I wanted to work for Steelcase and continue my role in workplace. So um, I became the workplace consultant for Steelcase. And as you guys know, they're a Fortune 500 ma uh, manufacturer that does a lot of workplace research. So um, they ingrained all of that in my brain, and I can't get rid of it. So I'm going to share some of that today, and then I'm also going to share some of my experiences in working on this side. Um, I left Steelcase two and a half years ago and started my own business, and um, we represent eight different brands that are commercial, workplace, and hospitality brands. So four furniture lines and four architectural lines. You'll see some of them in pictures. If you have any questions after, feel free to talk to me, but I'm not going to name them all. I'm just going to just talk about the application and workplace. But one of the brands that I represent is Watson, and they are a high-quality, high design-driven, um, American-made brand. So um, I wanted Sandy to partner with me on today's uh, discussion. I'll let you introduce yourself. <laughs> Can just get close to you and make noise again? <laughs> Sorry, I feel like I'm yelling. I'm a loud person anyway. Um, so my name's Sandy. I feel uniquely qualified to talk about furniture and workplace being born in North Carolina. So if you haven't been to High Point to... I'm off. I'm off. Are you off? <laughs> Is it me? it be mine. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, if you haven't been to North Carolina, you need to come there. It still is the furniture capital of the world. Um, it's part of our DNA. So I started working for a small furniture company in 1997. It was actually a company owned by Steelcase, the same place that Julia got her furniture background. Um, and I've been in it since that day, um, now working for Watson out on the West Coast. So I'm excited to be here. We took a CEU that we put together at Watson, and we kind of wove this story to talk to you about the workplace. The CEU originally started during the middle of the pandemic. So a lot has changed since then, and we're gonna dive into some of that stuff. But like Julia said, we're gonna take a look at the history. Am I going the wrong way, Julia? Yep, there we go. A quick history. So where'd the office begin? So at the, the, what is it about me? It's me, sorry, it's me. Um, so the, the word office comes from the Latin word apophysium. So the original offices started back in Roman culture. Yeah, sure. Not at all because I'm such a loud human. Hello, hello? Is that better? Can you hear me? Because I am. What? They thought they could hear me. 
Hello? Hello, hello? Yeah. Me again. <laughs> Nothing like technology to keep you on your toes. So, we go back in time, right, to around 500 AD when there was the first organized religion, government, and financial institutions. And when you have organized businesses, you have to have administrative positions, right? There's somebody that's got to handle the payroll, somebody that's got to keep, keep in touch with who owes you money. So that's when the first office workers actually originated, and it was a very dishonorable job. You know, it was, <laughs> I know. So it was an agricultural society. So if you weren't making things, right, that people could wear or people could eat, you weren't really contributing to society. So it wasn't very admirable to be in the office. You were confined to a desk all day long, right, in the dark. But a lot changed with the Industrial Revolution. Right? Only 5% of the U.S. population around the 1900s worked in an office. Everybody else worked in a factory or in an agricultural situation. So when we think about how did we take care of people, right? No one really was thinking about the health and the well-being of people until we became an industrial society. And then all of a sudden, we had to think about kids who were losing their hands in machines right, and working really long hours. So it was only around 1938 that the Fair Labor Standards Act was introduced. And that was the first time we took consideration for the health and well-being of anyone that was working, not just an office worker. So it did things like limit the work week to 44 hours. It also meant that you had to make at least 25 cents an hour and that you had to be at least 16 years of age before you could go to work in a factory. You could still work at home on the farm, though. So it was only when we had this act that we were able to say, somebody started thinking about the health and well-being of an employee, the physical health and well-being of an employee. And it was hard work, right? Repetitious. This isn't McDonald's, folks. People were working in factories. They were very dangerous jobs, long hours very bad conditions, and it was absolutely repetitive. Just like in our agricultural economy, we valued the physical being. So if work wasn't getting done, if you weren't hitting your productivity numbers, it's because you weren't working hard enough, physically giving it everything you had. So it was only till this guy came around that they started thinking about it differently. Anybody know who Frederick Taylor is? Do you guys study him in class at all? So Frederick Taylor introduced the principles of scientific management. And he was only 25 years old. He was on his way to Harvard. And um, he started losing his vision. So he knew that he wasn't going to be a scholar. So he went to work in a steel factory in Pennsylvania, Midvale. And when he was there, he determined, we could do this a lot better. There are ways to regiment this work. And if we took out the waste and the inefficiencies, we could make people work harder as long as we kept our eyes on them. So this was the beginning of manufacturing lines, assembly lines, where you took the motion out from between people, put them closer together, and things began to be produced and they would come out at the end. Always with someone in a crow's nest watching because you couldn't trust people, you had to watch them. So this is what Frederick Taylor did around the 1900s. It worked so well in the factories that as we turned into an industrial economy where we were creating amazing things that would change the world, we created more office jobs. And so by now, about 16% of the U.S. population is working in an office. And because what Frederick Taylor said in the manufacturing facility with assembly lines had worked so well there, surely it would work in the office. And so we have a design concept that came from a manufacturing facility that went straight into office design where we put everybody in lines and we talked about how work could be efficient. It was a flawed concept that in the 1900s was moved into the office and in the 2000s we're still using it. In over 100 years, the office hasn't changed. So when we think about how we can impact what's going on in the office and the tools that we have that will contribute to the well-being 
this is where Julie is going to bring out her workplace research moment. <laughs> and I'm just going to use this. It's easier. Um, Yes, so the workplace, I, I basically, even though I have a design degree, I'm going to throw in a little bit of workplace research, a little bit of facts, and I, I do have a Venn diagram at one point, so get excited about that. Um, all right, so the workplace really is a business tool, um, along with the workers being one of the largest assets of a business. The way you attract and retain business um, or workers in the workplace is really your, um, your office. So if someone comes in for an interview, do they get a good vibe? Do they get a good feeling? And um, when they talk to the other employers, do they see themselves as being able to work there? So what is the workplace? We're going to start, like I, um, Sandy explained, with the history and then really explain what it is. And as you guys know, work happens everywhere. And there's blurred lines of where it's actually happening. So any place that innovative thought happens for the betterment of that organization, whether it's profit or nonprofit, that can be considered part of your workplace. So you need to have the access to the tools at that place and at that location in order to do your best work. So um, the, there's a few different facts about the worker and the state of the workplace that I wanted to share. Never before have we been asked to do so much mentally, and there's this state of overwhelm that we experience in the workplace, and um, it affects us in numerous ways, cognitive well-being and um, emotional well-being. So in terms of what we're asked to process with our human brains on a daily basis, it, one of the facts is that every three minutes we are distracted in our work. So if, it, if we're being distracted every three minutes, then how does it... How long does it take to get back into that workflow? It actually takes 23 minutes. So if you're constantly being distracted, um, the stats show that basically you need to get back into flow 23 minutes later, and then you should not have to be distracted again. Um, and what that tells me in the workplace is it speaks to the statistic that 49% of the workers can't find an appropriate place to work, and that's they need a space that is meant to be um, supportive of the task that they're doing at the time. So that creates a huge case for why the workplace matters and why it's a business tool. Um, so if we take three different things, uh, or two different things and look at it, one is, as designers, we need to be designing for the employee task. And that task, um, if you net net it out, basically there's collaboration, focus, and then when you toggle between those two, you're gonna need a respite or a rejuvenation. So you should be able to do all three of those in your workplace. So if you're designing for the task, you're designing for those three things. And then also designing for three different types of well-being. And that's, as I mentioned before, cognitive, emotional, and physical well-being. So if we start with that in mind as our goal, we'll be talking through what that really looks like in terms of plan. Can you share a little bit more history? I'm gonna jog. I do. I love talking about the history of the office. So something happened, right? Um, something that was very cataclysmic for the entire world, and it wasn't COVID. Um, it was World War II. And World War II was an opportunity. Um, it changed the workplace, right? All of a sudden, men are off fighting a war. And so women were in the workplace. But that's not the important part. Um, the important part is where we began to understand how design can play a role in worker safety, right? So remember we talked about the Fair Labor Standards Act that you know keeps you safe, thinks about how long you work, how hard you work, your physical well-being. So that's all still going on, right? But we're in the middle of a war, and we had a lot of men who were plucked right out of factories and out of farm fields, and they were all of a sudden flying planes, right, over the ocean and across Europe. And they crashed by the thousands. Um, and that, it was blamed on the man, right? They were all men. Um, it was blamed on them. It had to be pilot error, right? Um, so after the war, a really beautiful thing happened. All of the allied nations came together and they began to talk about how we could have done things differently, right? So you can only look after something happens and say, what should we have done differently? So one of the things that they explored is, why did all these planes crash, right? We trained these guys. And it was really a stupidly simple reason 
There were two buttons, one that lowers your landing gear and one that lowers the wing flaps. And they looked exactly alike. So imagine, you know, you're 22 years old, you're flying around trying to dodge bullets, and you're going to land and you push the wrong button because it looks exactly like the one beside it. And it's the very first time that anyone used the word design error, right? And so in that moment, it became clear that if we had designed these two things differently, heck, even a different color, how many lives we possibly could have saved. And so that was the beginning of that group of people who got together to study this is what's known as the HFES, Human Factor Something Science. Um, I can give you, I can tell you what that means later. But it's the group that started talking about the ergonomics. Ergonomics was the fancy word, Human Factor Ergonomics Society. Um, so it was this group that had, was now exploring how we could do things differently and designing the tools, right, for the person. Remember right before Frederick Taylor, it's only you're not working hard enough and that's why we're not efficient and that's why productivity is low. But if we said we're going to give you things that help make you more efficient, we're going to design things to help you be more efficient, that's what the HFES did. And, oh, I, didn't, I never changed to that slide, sorry. So in that, so this was around the 70s, right? There was also um, in the 70s a time where there was this mysterious illness. People were complaining that they had this pain in their wrist. And Dr. George Phelan diagnosed carpal tunnel syndrome for the first time, right? And so that became, can we make tools so people who are now confined to that desk working will be healthier, right? They're not likely to lose a hand and a press on a factory floor, but their wrist hurts. So what can we do differently? So this whole ergonomics aspect became part of popular conversation. And that chair right there made it a household word. Does anybody know that chair? <laughs> this front row cheats. You can't talk to them. Um, this is the Herman Miller Aeron chair. We never worked for Herman Miller, so I'm not promoting it. But you can get it at any Costco now, right? This became, in the 1990s, the chair that everybody that worked at a desk thought they had to have, right? Um, it was the first ergonomic chair, and it opened the door for every furniture designer to come out with a chair that provided the same kind of ergonomic support that this one did. This was also the time that, um, let's see if you know this one. It was a slogan that said, sitting is the new smoking. That's going to way predate all of you guys. So if you were sit sitting at a desk, Nils de Friant wrote Human Scale 1, 2, 3, right? So he took all the stuff that the Ergonomic Society was doing on these really large documents and secretively and put it into plain English so that it was public. It was published for anyone. Any designer could read now what was recommended. So you all had the opportunity. And in reading that, we're like, we're sitting down all the time. We need, Nils de Friant said, sitting is not even a normal human posture. You shouldn't do it, right? So even though you had that great ergonomic chair, this was the time everybody wanted a, a standing height desk, right? A desk that goes up and down. So in addition to that, we now have standing height desks. In fact, the sitting as a new smoking was a marketing campaign, but everybody bought into it. The guy who came up with that had designed a walking treadmill for your desk, and he was trying to sell it. So he was trying to convince Americans that it was dangerous to sit all day because he was going to make money off of it. It was brilliant. So everything was just fine. We had the best chair on the planet. We had a desk that went up and down. We had a diagnosis for carpal tunnel syndrome. If you guys had been around in the 90s, you would have seen people standing at their desks doing this all day long because we had to have breaks to move our joints around. But then something else happened. You guys lived through this one. Does anybody know? Yeah. So it's not, it, it is not a big statement to say this. I, I believe fully. World War II was cataclysmic, right? It changed everything about every aspect of our lives, including how we thought about work. And we thought everything was just fine until this happened. And all of a sudden, we had a silent, invisible killer in the office. That Herman Miller chair was not going to save your butt this time, right? We all packed up and went home working out of bean bags, 
on sofas, at dining room tables. Nobody cared about their ergonomic chair, did you? Anybody? No. So when we think about this being the most actually terrifying time, right, the few years that we were going through it, um, PTSD, right? When we think about how we, we lived through this, right? None of us lived through the war, but we lived through this war. And it is changing everything. And the opportunity, the potential that it presents to this group to have influence over the way all of us work in the future, right? Forget everything we knew. Forget it all. And now you have the possibility to take us beyond this and think about how do we get people back in the office, right? The office solved for a problem, right? We needed a place to go to work. We, for all of us, right? Um, each one of us had a different experience. For me, I have a very, very small house. When I was at home, I had to repurpose a room to become my office, right? So I was on Zoom calls and there was a bed behind me. Um, some of my, some of the people that I work with have lovely large homes and had home offices built, right? The lucky ones that were able to have this space in their house that they could make an office. And then there are others who had kids at home and had to work at the dining room table while also trying to, you know, get their eight-year-old to do their homework. So we all had a different experience and the office solves for those of us that don't have that ideal experience, right? Now we have a place to go, a place to be really productive a place where we can work on culture. The mental well-being that was put at risk during this pandemic when we all were isolated, right? We were taken away from our work friends. So how do we, do we get people back into an office? And so what's the right solution? Julie is gonna take us down some paths of what we think, right? We don't know yet. We're still just a couple of years into this. We don't know what the right solution is, and it's changing daily, right? If every day that you read the paper, what's the right solution? So we have to evolve, right? And it's no longer enough to think about your back doesn't hurt when you're seated or your wrist hurt, but we have to think about the mental well-being of our employees. For me, I work with fantastically young and bright people, and to see how they struggled through the pandemic, and now when I was in the, at their age, developing relationships at work, right? This is where we meet our best friends, my best friends. Christina and I have been friends forever um, because we work together. So how do we solve for the solutions to get, solve for the problem that exists now, that we need to have this cognitive well-being as well as our physical well-being in the workspace, workspace? So we're gonna take a look at some options. Um, so looking forward at what we kind of took a look at the history of the workplace and um, looking forward, what do we really need to be focused on? The must have factors in the office. Um, I think it, like Sandy said, this is an awesome time to innovate on um, in the office and it's an awesome time in terms of being able to support all of these types of well-being. So this is where I promised you the, um, the Venn diagram. <laughs> um, so well-being, physical well-being is one of the things that we need to be designing for as, um, as designers. And it's, it's kind of cliche because you've heard it all before, but um, this talks about different postures in the workplace. And from being on the manufacturer side, I do uh, see clients asking for different types of postures. And people vote with their feet. So if there's three different types of rooms here, you would vote with your feet and go right to that space that you feel the most um, comfortable in. So physical well-being talks about movement and posture. And then um, cognitive well-being is really what I was telling you about um, focusing on designing for the task. So that's again, collaboration and um, focus work and then rejuvenation. And then we'll talk about emotional well-being and um, that you need to be inspired in your space and create a space that's inspiring for um, those workers and a space that, where they can connect to others because the workplace really needs to be the best access to technology and people in order for people to actually make the trek in. So um, that's the goal. We'll start with physical well-being and um, 
the well-being aspect basically like i mentioned it talks about different levels of posture and that's perching sitting standing and walking throughout the office environment and then movement even in a seated position and a, having a different palette of presence whether you're um, actually there in person or whether you're virtual so this is a great example of different postures. Um, in the back, you have a lounge setting, and then you have uh, people perched at bar tops, and then people perched in seating environments. Um, different types of environments like this are really popular, and they're requested and asked for in, um, in the workplace nowadays because, as I mentioned, people vote with their feet, so they will go. Um, notice both people are sitting on the banquette side of this seating arrangement. Banquettes are great ways to have modular furniture in your space. Um, and also divide space. Um, so banquettes are really great. Um, but this actually is just shown in terms of physical well-being as different postures. So what we're seeing more of, like Sandy mentioned, is height adjustable desks. But they've de definitely gotten more sexy over the, <laughs> over the time. Um, so this is a height adjustable desk where uh, the gentleman in this private office can just kick his chair away and decide to stand. Um, most of them nowadays sometimes have timers. Most of them are automated in terms of their height adjustability. But the ability to um, move throughout um, your day is super important, and that's where it ties into the physical well-being, is you should be able to have environments that you design into your space that gives that user the choice and control over where and how they're going to work. And then um, this, many of you guys might know uh, this lady, Patricia Urquiola. She designed this chair, and um, this is an example of um, just an individual lounge chair or an individual task chair. So you still have the automated stuff like the tilt and, um, and height adjustment and personal adjustments in seating. But even while we're in a seated position, it's important to have movement in our um, seated position as well. So one of the things that um, people are, one of the things that's kind of a simple example but people are doing now is in between neighborhoods, they're um, removing the individual waste cans and then putting them at the end of workstation runs and then moving the copier and the things that you might want, like a water cooler, and putting them at the end of runs so it encourages you to get up and walk and move over to that environment where you might need um, a shared resource like waste can cans. So that's just another example of how they're incorporating movement into a workspace. And then another aspect of physical well-being is, are you present, um, phys virtual versus analog? So incorporating both types is really important into the space because you need to do both types, whether you're um, working from home or not. There's a different level of engagement when it comes to collaboration that's happening in an analog way versus a uh, um, virtual way. And then cognitive well-being, um, when it comes to oh, the sense of overwhelm, our brains are being asked to do so much more nowadays in the office, and we're toggling between different types of um, tasks in the workplace. So cognitive well-being is, again, super important, but then also we're coming from that engagement um, where we were really separated from a lot of our colleagues and separated from corporate culture. So um, that has a big tie into, um, and you, you had. So I just wanted to point out, um, yeah. so in May of last year, so just May of 2023, the Surgeon General for the United States declared isolation an endemic. It's a disease in the United States. So when we think about cognitive well-being, we can't think about it enough. It's, it's enough that it's on the radar as being something that we should be very aware of, suicide rates, uh, people who are not functioning to their fullest, uh, to the maximum of their of their uh, capabilities in the state. But it's it's a big thing. It's a, it's a thing. It's a thing. I'm sure you guys know. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about cognitive well-being. And as I mentioned, designing for the task is completely important. Um, the collaborative room that you might need for collaboration might look completely different than obviously a room for focus. And um, as you're toggling between collaboration and focus, you need a hot minute to just take a respite and um, rejuvenate. So in terms of cognitive, uh, or excuse me, in terms of collaboration, this is a great opportunity or a great example of a collaborative table that might be in the middle of an um, office space where you can easily walk up. And if I run into Sandy in um, 
coming out of a meeting or whatever, we can instantly pop over to this table. And if it's in front of a whiteboard, um, that's even better because it's a great opportunity to um, collaborate in an analog way. One of research, uh, workplace research says that if you're already in a seated position, it, like a bar height, um, you're much more likely to walk up and participate in the whiteboard and participate in the dialogue of what's, the collaboration of what's going on in that room. Um, but if you're seated and you might be seated on the back side of a conference table, you're much less likely to collaborate. So um, it's more, it, it's considered more innovative to have a lot of standing um, environments, and it's also considered better for your physical health as well. So building in um, opportunities to collaborate, like those standing height tables is important, but then also um, building it into your workspaces. So if I was seated in an environment and then Sandy just popped over and wanted to um, collaborate with me, this is a great opportunity to collaborate on a whiteboard table, just right, right on the table. Um, and then building it into the workspace runs, um, workplace at the end of a run or whatever, building in a collaborative table. The one on the left um, is actually a lazy Susan that's made out of a micro, uh, marker board. So be thinking as a designer that um, you could design into your spaces collaboration, but you can design that into your space, but you can also design it with your furniture. So both of them can really complement each other. Um, so you have numerous different ways that you can solve for some of these things. Um, and that's what's fun about what I've done is I've been on the manufacturer side, I've been on the design side. So um, it's fun to kind of look at it from how you can solve for these different things with different applications. Um, so then in terms of focus spaces, there's so many, as I'm sure the, um, I'm sure you guys know, you've seen a lot of these little pods that have become really popular. Um, it's important when you design um, for pods in, in real life, you have to worry about the ADA accessibility and if you have a space that's accessible, um, you have to have another space. Uh, if you have a space that's accessible for a non-ADA um, person, you need an ADA um, complement to that same type of space. And then on the left, you see little areas for focus and respite as well. So building these little, tiny, these little focus spaces in is important. Um, and then when you have focus spaces, you also need to pay attention to um, sound attenuation and um, noise reduction with like acoustics. So building those things in um, to your focus spaces is really important as well. So reju rejuvenation spaces, having areas outside. Work is really coming, as you guys know, outside. Um, so having power receptacles and tables um, that, you can, that support your work and your task outside is also important. Um, these are just examples of respite spaces and um, areas to work outside. And then connection to daylight um, is also something that we desperately need. So emotional well-being, um, Sandy touched on it a little bit, but emotional well-being is really all about um, being able to be connected with your company brand. So as you guys design for your um, company spaces, how do they see their brand? And most of the time, it's not in a very literal sense where you take your product and you put your logo all over the wall. It's a more subtle, um, more comforting sense of we understand our, what our co company culture is because of the way we work and the way we have choice inside the workplace. So if they have choice and control over the where and how they work, they start to feel that company brand. So um, a lot of interpersonal connections happen in the workplace. Like you said, some of the, your closest friends have um, come out of your work experiences, some of mine as well. And um, I think those work experiences that you have inside the workplace, um, it has been said, I, I don't remember what publish, um, publisher said this, but basically, when you start to have um, connections at the workplace, say you say this is a conversation happening outside of a break room or whatever, if you start to have these little conversations and get to know that person, say I walk up to Sandy and I, I, I say, hey, how was your weekend? We start sharing stories. And when you start sharing stories, you start learning to trust that person. And when you start learning to trust that person, then you're more likely to share ideas. And when you share ideas in a workplace environment, you start to innovate together. So those social interactions are so key to innovating. And 
getting ahead in terms of strategy for a corporate business. So the um, emotional connection in between the individual people is super important to innovation as a whole. Um, another thing that is important is uh, access to daylighting. And I'm gonna also talk about functionality in terms of the space with this slide. Um, this is a telescoping wall and um, it telescopes from side to side, so that's why they call it a telescoping wall. But um, if you design things like this into your space, it's great functionally because it opens up a whole entire space. A lot of times they can pocket into a wall so you don't even see it, um, but you would need an access panel or something like that. And um, getting into the weeds a little bit, you'd probably need a beam on top and then two columns on the side. But what ends up happening with these telescoping walls is it really opens up the space, but then you have access to daylight. Um, so it can bring daylight into your space. And when you don't have something like that, maybe you have a solid wall and you need that solid wall to put technology on. If you're designing a space that has solids, um, the previous floor plan back in the days um, of old office spaces, they would take the private offices and put them all the way around the perimeter and then the interior of the floor plate would be very dark. So designing spaces that all have equal access to daylight and views is really important. The reason I show this slide is because uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of times we're getting asked for clear story windows, and clear story windows are what you're seeing at the top, where say they need a solid wall on the bottom uh, to support technology, you can have a clear story window on the top. Um, and then also the access to daylighting and views, like I said earlier, people would vote with their feet. So if you have areas that don't have access to natural light or don't have access to te the proper technology to do your task that you need to do, then you will go to a different spot and vote with your feet and you'll see maybe areas like this that are really populated because they have access to power or access to daylight and views. So other considerations besides, so we kind of covered the four, the three pillars of well-being, and then um, some of uh, the tasks, collaboration and rejuvenation and focus. So some of the other considerations in building a really strong um, workplace is in between spaces. So you think about, okay, I need this, um, I need this amount of conference rooms in my um, in my programming, and I need this, I need to, this amount of workstations and my programming, but what do you do with the in-between space and how do you utilize that space? So if you had a floor plate and someone's paying for that, someone's paying for a lease on that, how do you utilize that square footage um, and make it really useful? Every single square foot counts. So if, I, if Sandy and I are walking out of that conference room and she's like, hey, I need to talk to you about so-and-so, we could instantly sit down in those little benches have a conversation, have a small meeting, or pop into any other area. So having the in-between space also be completely functional is really important. You don't want to waste one square foot. And then also having varied room size. Most meetings are actually small in independent meetings, and most meetings might be only like 30 minutes just to have a touch point and then um, go back to work. So having varied meeting sizes is really important. Um, these individual phone rooms are good, but one of the things that we're seeing as a new trend is instead of having all your conference chairs being chair one and it's this chair, um, each conference room really does, has a different personality or each um, living type area room has a different personality. So we're seeing lots of varied uh, furniture in individual conference rooms and team rooms. And then another thing I mentioned earlier is acoustics. Acoustics is really um, becoming something that's built into spaces now. It didn't used to be um, built into spaces, but we're seeing this recycled PET on the far left that can be direct glued to the wall, and um, it has a great uh, noise reduction coefficient. If you guys haven't, um, aren't familiar with that yet, NRC um, is an acoustic term. It's noise reduction coefficient, and um, each acoustical product will have that NRC rating. The higher it is, the better. Um, so it can come in, acoustic products can come anywhere in panels, tiles, um, even in ceiling that goes directly in the existing grid, and then also in acoustic lighting. So there's tons of options, but acoustics should be built into your spaces because you don't want that reverberation. Um, and then I sh uh, 
I have a lot of people right now asking for acoustic art. So you can put acoustic panels behind gallery art and um, it's a great solution to not be kind of in your face acoustics. So uh, beauty and inspiration needs to be infused in each of the spaces. We talked about cognitive and emotional well-being. This plays a huge role into it because as a designer, we're, at least I, am an emotional being. And part of the reason why I went into design is because I loved the idea of taking something that was a design idea and making it tangible and then finding out what that does for the user. So um, that is that connection to that human experience of seeing this idea come to life and become a tangible space that can now impact their life. That's why I became a designer. So this connection to space, you need to have insp inspiration in the space and inspiration in brand as well as beauty. And all of this, um, if you want to dive deeper, is actually um, a new article that Alina Cardet of um, Arcadis, she's local, but she just introduced this new article um, posted in the Work Design Magazine. So if you want to dive deeper, it's on her LinkedIn page, um, but it really talks a lot more in depth about the um, emotional connection of spaces. Do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah. So um, just another thing, I did write it down because Elena in her, um, because I, the company I work for, we design furniture, right? That's what we do. Um, one of the, we have three pillars of our brand and one of them is it's got to be pretty, right? Understated beauty. And in Elena's article, after we had dinner with her last night, I was reading it and it's, she, this quote, she says, we think and feel beauty. And I, Oh, that should be our brand pillar because it is amazing, right? We do think and we feel beauty, but we're always trying to validate that with functionality. It's never enough just to say it's pretty. And I think it's high time that we say, you know, it's really pretty. I want to go work there, right? So it's kind of a cool thing, but there's so many other factors you have to take into consideration because we have to qualify everything, right? So um, Julia did a great job of talking about choice. People vote with their feet. Flexibility in the office. Um, you know, it, it can't be undervalued at this point. The, I wish I could say that in the years I've been working in furniture that I've seen things change. And I wish I could say that since the pandemic and people are starting to design offices again to try to get employees to come back, things are changing. But I want to tell you, I hope you're the guys that do it because I'm not seeing it yet. There's still so much potential in what we do. But the flexibility of the office, right, being able to, what? One day there's going to be 10 people in the office. Tomorrow there's going to be five people in the office. The office, office needs to be able to expand and contract to the work that you're doing. It needs to be flexible. It needs to be agile. If you need to change it around because today four of you really need to be close and working together, your office furniture should respond to that. So flexibility within the not just the design of the space, but the furniture that you put into that space. Creating... Um, well, let me say, I'll start with something different. I work with a lot of the largest companies in the world, right? They're, they're standardized on some of our products. They're talking about these collaborative spaces. The new hot job is ancillary specialist. If you don't know it, there's, there, there are plenty of job postings out there for ancillary specialist. They're talking about creating spaces where people can come collaborate, right? Nobody wants to go work at a desk anymore. They want to be in a space. Um, in fact, one of the largest technology companies in the world changed all the chairs around their conference tables because when people did come back, they didn't want to go sit in the 500 workstations. They wanted to sit with the other 20 people in the office in the conference room so they could be close together. So we think about creating spaces for people to work. You have to have hard surfaces, right? You can only, I, one of the furniture companies I worked for a long time ago, and our friend Christina is going to remember this, um, where we took all of our conference rooms and we put soft seating in there. And I was like, wow, where am I going to put my laptop or my computer at this point? Where's my notebook going to go? Um, vertical surfaces to put things on, whatever the shape, whatever they are, you need to allow people to have this space to spread out, right? So that may be free range within that office, not just your workstation today, but to work as a group together at a table. The heads down focus though, you know, this is, there's no place better in the workstation. 
um, our VP of Design and Development, he says, we believe that you do your best work in the office, and we believe that if that desk is yours, right, I want the picture. I, there's going to be a picture of my dog at my desk. Um, I guarantee you that, right? But you know, hoteling is an option as well, but when you need that head down focus, this is the kind of place that you want to be. It's also very important as you're thinking about furniture in the workplace. Um, Julia was saying it best, and I love how she talks about it. Inspiration's out there everywhere, right? You can go, you don't know if it was AI-generated picture of a piece of furniture that doesn't really exist in this world, or it is a real piece of furniture. So knowing, knowing the furniture, where it comes from, that it is tested to the standards that are required for an office, right? So there's an industry called BIFMA, the, I, I can't remember, at this moment I can't, Manufacturers Association Furniture Facility. So they test, they set the standards for testing furniture, right? They want to make sure that when you sit down in that chair, it's not going to fall over. Um, they want to make sure that, that um, the quality of that furniture, the durability of that furniture, is such that you would be able to work in it repeatedly. So understanding furniture quality, um, you know, I love IKEA probably as much as the next guy, right? Um, the production methods that are used, the assembly methods that are used, there's a reason that contract furniture is built by contract furniture manufacturers. It is intended for the use that we recognize for an office, and it's going to last you, right? So understanding that there is a, a quality standard, um, and don't be afraid to ask, right? Ask somebody about it. Um, just being fun, right? Um, we don't have to be stodgy anymore, though. I tell you, there's a lot of floor plates I'm looking at every day that looks very stodgy and very conservative. Um, don't be afraid to have fun. Remember what Elena said? We feel beauty. Yeah. Um, I particularly, I think I should have been born in Florida because I love pink flamingos. <laughs> so that's my beauty, right? I would have the most bright and colorful office that you could possibly have. Have a little fun with it. Um, fabrics, finishes, powder coats, paints. Do something fun. Make it exciting so that when people come in there, they're compelled to be in that space. You also have the opportunity when you're working with companies to reflect their brand, right? We all want to, just being in that space, you want to know who you're working for when you're in there. The, the technology company um, known as Alphabet, right, Google, um, I remember one of the first projects we did with them in one of their very first buildings, they had floors. They had all of their primary colors of the Google, so each floor had one particular color. So you could tell if something got moved from one floor to the next, if it was on the wrong floor because of the color. Have fun with it. Think about really fun ways of making the workplace attractive and interesting. Be whimsical. Go ahead. And the personalization options, right? So, um, you know, when you look at an office, it, we call it private office because it's behind walls, right? It's an office. Um, we have shelves for a reason, because we want to put a picture of our dog on there. We want our plants there because we're proud of them, right? We want to put a picture of our ski trip. Not that I ski, but maybe you would want to put your ski trip out there. Personalization of your space, right? So when we start thinking about coming back to the office and you're only there two days a week, how do you make that space feel like your own, right? I, the girls that I work with, I see some of you with blankets. They bring their blankets to work, right? It's their space, and they have a hook. It's there. They might not be back there tomorrow, but when they do come back, their blanket's going to be there. The investment in this real estate um, and also the investment in your people by allowing them to decorate and create spaces that are uniquely theirs. Maybe it's just the storage, right? A safe place to put your lunch so nobody gets it. A safe place to hide illicit things. So working within the office, right, there, it's, there's a, such a thing as thinking about the shape of furniture, right? So we worked with a design team, Mike and Micah, out of San Francisco on a, a collection of furniture during the middle of the pandemic. They were designing it. And it was very important to them that everything about that product have these soft, round edges because it meant there wasn't just a space for you and me, there was a space for everyone. So when you think about round ottomans, tables with rounded ends, um, these are, these shapes 
automatically instill in the person in that space that there's a place for me there. I can be there. On a round ottoman, three people could sit on it, right, and never even know that each other are there. So think about the shape of furniture that you're using in a space because it can create these dynamic places for people to join. And they can join and still be alone, but it allows everyone to have a place. It's inclusion. So always think about the shapes when you're doing it. So our finale, we're almost done. Um, you know, I wish uh, if I'd have known Elena's quote yesterday, it would have been on here rather than to say um, the office is what, something people freely choose because they enjoy it and the company of people. Yeah, that's the brightest thing ever said. Um, but I think the most important thing is to say the opportunity that is in front of you, right? The opportunity that's in front of you. A lot of the stuff that we talked about looking back historically, you didn't work in those places, right? You have the opportunity to change the way people work now and determine if the office is where we all need to be. It's pretty exciting and I can't wait to see it. And right on time. <laughs> <laughs> You know, technology's changed so much since I've been around. Um, one of the things I think you have to plan for is that it's going to change again tomorrow, right? So you can't um, access to power outlets, right? That's the most important thing. Can, can somebody charge up where they are, right? You're finding power solutions in the oddest places. That's really all you can think about right now is making sure that all of the tools that we use to be productive have a place to charge. Uh, beyond that, two years from now, it's going to be different than it is today. Um, one of the, I was telling Julia about an article in the Wall Street Journal this morning, headline right above the fold, um, the impact of AI on the office and the number of white collar workers that are being let go and jobs that aren't going to be replaced because technology can do them. I don't know how you design for that, right? There's not a piece of furniture for that. So, man, that's a big mystery. I don't know. I don't know a better answer. It's a good question. Oh, that's a, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> um, I, I think from my life as a designer, I, I spent, um, I've been in the industry for 20 years uh, since graduating and um, I'm aging myself, but I graduated in 2000 uh, from University of Missouri. And um, the things that I loved about Workplace is um, it's, it's a place that brings people together. And like I said, I was inspired to um, see what it, uh, an idea that wasn't tangible become something that was tangible. So um, the things that, um, even I was talking to Tanya earlier, the things that I learned are just about the interpersonal connections and that you really need to listen. Um, Technology is always gonna change and we learned to adapt to it and be able to um, deal with it, not necessarily building it in. That was one of the takeaways um, from being in design as well as being in furniture. Um, but the interpersonal connections, I didn't come from a sales background. Um, I just came from a design background. So when you really understand design and you really listen to the people and understand that it's about people um, and that emotional connection, then I feel like you can do anything because I don't, I sell furniture for a living, but at the same, <laughs> I don't have a furniture background. I don't have a sales background, but I just listen to that person. And if they hate that chair, I'm like, okay, we'll talk about a different one. Um, so I really feel like it's the interpersonal connections and listening to the people um, 
but I feel like design is just a super inspiring thing to be in. This industry is so vast and so broad, and there's so many things that we could do as designers. Um, I maintain my license and my credentials um, just because I feel it's super important. Um, and if there's another test that I can take, I will take it. <laughs> just because I think um, it's important to continue to grow in our industry, but this is such an awesome industry. I would never do anything else. I would never be in any other industry. There's so many different career paths and career avenues that you can take within this um, design industry. So um, just explore, um, but one of my favorite roles was really just being in design because that set me up for knowing everything else that I've done in my career. Um, I wouldn't have been able to be successful as a workplace consultant had I not been on the design side. And I think the reason why people trust me on the furniture side is because I've sat in the design chair. So I, I think um, a lot of that is my experience and the design side. So I don't know if that answered all the questions in your question. <laughs> Yeah. Do you want to take this one or do you want me to? That's a million dollar question. Yeah. So the question, the question is, is there a golden ratio of um, private office and enclosed spaces versus open spaces? Um, it, I don't think that there's a golden ratio in any way, shape, or form. I think it's really based on the company and the organization um, and how they work. A technology organization might work totally differently than a call center, for example. So. Um, I think it depends on what the tasks are that the workers are being asked to do. And a lot of um, companies that have come to us say, okay, our legal and accounting department and our HR department needs to be enclosed for security purposes, but then the rest of the teams are innovating and um, working on strategy, so they need to be completely open and they need to have access. A lot of the things that after, I wanna say like 2009, a lot um, there was a lot of layoffs in 2009 um, and what ended up happening is they lost a certain generation of the workers. The middle fell out. You were either the younger or the uh, management level and the middle fell out. Well, what ended up happening is no one had those inter-office communications where I could learn from you and you were my mentor in the office. You know, that was missing all of a sudden after those, those, that time. So that open office environment is really important for idea sharing and relationships in the office. So I think to answer your question, it, it depends on the organization. There's no golden ratio, but I think that's where we as designers can help program for them because um, they don't know how many butts and seats they need versus how many offices. I think the flexibility of the space of having offices that at least when they're not being used, that they can be used as um, multifunctional spaces like conference rooms and teaming rooms. I think that's important um, because there's less assigned offices anymore where it's Sam's office. Um, but there's, there, I'm not seeing a golden ratio of like anything. Do you have anything to add? And it's, it's somehow tied to it when you think about um, design, what designers are, to, should be able to help with that ratio. What I am seeing is that the C-suite is having a lot more say in what's happening in the office. So just like we have at Access, we can Google and find the price of anything, right? Or the availability of something. Um, interestingly enough, we're finding in our demographics that more business owners are doing their research before they engage with designers or dealers to outfit their office. So a lot of that falls into what that CEO thinks. Right? So the age of that CEO, sometimes the gender of that CEO is going to drive those decisions. Right? We're working with a logistics company in Ohio right now that's putting a workstation in for every single employee. Five floors, 1,500 workstations. Every mid-level manager gets a private office. Every C-suite gets a bigger private office. It's the most traditional way of working. It's because Pete, that owns the company, wants it that way, right? I mean, that's, that's the sacrifice you're making. He's working with a great design team, a wonderful design team, um, but he makes every decision. 
So I see a lot more of that balance of power going to the C-suite right now. Um, they're more thoughtful about how they're spending their money and how they want you to work. Yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, that was in the 90s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I hate that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So he's talking about um, a lot of our images didn't have, remember that beautiful Aeron chair? Uncomfortable, but beautiful. Um, and we didn't show a lot of that. And I think that was, in my opinion, right, uh, a race to the bottom. So once the ergonomic chair was out of the bag, right, everybody knew about it, every manufacturer came out with one. There's so many levers and buttons and things that you can control on your chair that it becomes a distraction in and of itself, right? You can't focus on what you're doing because you're constantly moving your armrest up and down or sliding them in and out. So the chairs themselves, they're, who's to say one's better than the other? So it's, it's more personal choice at this point as to whether in, in our office we stand more than we sit. So we have bar height chairs um, that we just like kind of prop on. So, I, you know, I, I, it's a curious and interesting fact of where's, what's the future of ergonomic chairs in general? Yeah. Back in the day, you could pick them up on a street corner, right? There were so many of them for sale. Yeah. Thank you. Guys, you guys are great. Thank you all.